Okay. Well, thanks everyone for joining us for our webinar today about environmental law. I uh, hope everyone is staying well. My name is Alexis Stoymanoff and I'm the Communications Director here at West Coast Environmental Law. I am here in Vancouver on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. And we'd love to know where you are too, so uh, feel free to send a message in the chat uh, and let us know where you're zooming in from today. You can find the chat window at the bottom of your window, just look for the little chat icon. So in the next hour, uh, we're gonna be sharing with you uh, an introduction to environmental law. Uh, we'll be hearing from three of my legal colleagues uh, from West Coast. Uh, Andrew Gage is a staff lawyer uh, who's heading up our climate program. Uh, Stephanie Houston is part of our marine law team working on ocean law. And Eugene Kung is a lawyer working on issues around the Trans Mountain Pipeline and Tanker Project. And he's also part of our Indigenous law team, working with Indigenous uh, nations who are working to revitalize and apply their Indigenous laws to environmental challenges. So uh, we're really excited to have a bunch of young people and students on the webinar today, as well as people of all ages who just want to get a kind of 101 uh, on environmental law. Uh, if you have any questions during the webinar, you can send them in using the chat function and we'll get to them at the end of the session in our Q&A. We also have a bunch of questions that came in during registration, so we'll get to those in a little while as well. Um, our, during the webinar, our experts are going to give you uh, a bit of an introduction just to learn some of the basics of environmental law, uh, what it is, and how law is being used in BC and Canada to protect the environment and to stop climate change. So um, just one last note, if you're participating in the chat, uh, just a reminder to please keep it respectful, constructive, and on topic. And uh, with that, I think I'll just turn it over to our legal experts. Thanks, Alexis. Hi, everyone. My name is Eugene Kong. I'm a staff lawyer with West Coast Environmental Law. Um, just grab this first slide here. And um, I want to start by talking about this slide. Uh, this is a, this photo is uh, an image of the head tax certificate of my grandfather you look at it closely you can see that he was age 13 uh, at the time this photo was taken um, and the certificate was issued on May 23rd 1923. Um, for those who don't know the head tax was a, a policy of the Canadian government that was brought in uh, initially to try and discourage and dissuade uh, immigration from China specifically. And at the time, you'll notice that the head tax uh, was uh, amount was $500. Uh, at that time in 1923, $500 would buy you a brand new house in Vancouver. So it was a really significant amount of money. And um, I share this uh, to start off for a, a bunch of reasons. Uh, first, I think it's important to remember our own ancestors and, and how we uh, got to where we are today. And obviously uh, with my grandfather, he was one of the first members of my family to arrive here in Canada. Also because you know, we're here, we're gonna talk a little bit about the law and, um, and, and I really wanted to just you know, illustrate that uh, the law is more often used as a tool of oppression than it is of liberation. But at the end of the day, and as we'll talk a little bit later, um, the way we see it is it is in fact a tool. And so it's about how you use that tool to achieve the overall goal. Another reason um, I like to show this photo is um, to just recognize that uh, despite the fact that my family uh, arrived here in Canada under uh, clearly racist laws, which you know the federal government has since apologized for, uh, grounding in, in the idea and ideology of white supremacy, um, that we, my family and, and myself have still benefited from colonization. And so sitting with that uh, as part of our work and as part of my uh, place in the world, I carry that with me. And the final thing or reason that I like to share this is because when I discovered this document, which was uh, at, long after my grandfather passed away, it was actually after my uncle passed uh, away and he had been holding on to this, 
Uh, I realized for the first time that my grandfather's name was Moon Man, which I just think is really cool. And um, I wish I had that, that cool of a name. So we're gonna start with uh, a really big question. What, before we get into environmental law, we wanna know what is law? And so I'm gonna ask, just invite you right now, uh, if you're sitting at your computer, to type in the chat box. When, I, when you think about what is law, what comes to mind? And let's give you a few seconds to, uh, to throw that in the chat. Not seeing too many things in there. But some folks just, uh, yeah, put it, put it right in there. There's no wrong answers. It's just a, a way to kind of keep starting our, our uh, getting our conversation started. Okay, so I'm seeing things like rules that we live by, rules that govern our society, regulations and guidelines. Great. Just a reminder to folks, if you want everybody to be able to see your comment, uh, you have to select all panelists and attendees uh, for the chat. Great. So this is great. Um, you know, you're all, the great news is that every single one of you who answered is right. Um, you know, it's about the rules, it's about the, the norms, it's about governance and how we kind of manage ourselves. But I also want to just challenge you to think about law as, a, as an even broader concept. You know, we think often about, um, you know, the supreme law in Canada is the Constitution, right? And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to borrow a little from one of my uh, legal scholar heroes, John Burroughs, who just uh, talked about this in a podcast uh, with uh, Raven um, called Raven Debriefs. You can check that out. Uh, I really encourage you to check that out. Uh, but really, he talks about law and constitution uh, as an act, right? So if constitution is supreme law, it comes from the verb to constitute, which means putting our relations together. And this verb is an action, right? And so it's the act of bringing ourselves together and creating relationships and creating exactly what you said, that, you know, the sets of norms or rules or standards that we, that we uh, live by and that, we, and that govern us. Um, and what that means is that law is not just what legislatures and courts do, but what you and I do on an everyday basis in terms of our interpersonal interactions. Now in Canada, um, the Supreme Court has said many times that the law is a living tree. It's something that changes, it's something that grows, something that reacts to the, in, to the conditions around it. And, um, and so, you know, just like these trees behind me in uh, the Ewok village, uh, this is a, it's a constantly growing and changing thing. And so I think that's, that's another piece of it that's really important to remember is that it's a dynamic uh, process. Now in Canada, um, we have what's known as a pluralistic legal system, which, and all that means is that there are multiple legal traditions that inform the Canadian legal tradition. And the two most, you know, the two uh, founding uh, legal traditions are the common law, which comes from the English tradition, that's kind of the idea that uh, the cases that come before, you know, set the precedent for future cases. And then uh, the civil law tradition, which uh, primarily came from the French uh, uh, tradition, and that's where there's a civil code. And through that, the interpretation of that code is where we kind of get our laws from. Now, there's a big part missing in that, and, and we're going to talk a little bit about that later. But um, of course, when uh, Canada asserted sovereignty, when the British and the French initially arrived in these lands, there were already people here, Indigenous people living here with complex societal and legal structures. And it's those Indigenous laws that we're gonna, I'm going to talk a little bit about later, but it's something that Canadian courts have recognized and, um, and that I, I, I'm going I'm to talk about, about how they're part of this larger work to uh, protect the environment. Finally, um, I talked a little bit about how law is a tool and lawyers by that definition are tradespeople. You know, we aren't, any, we aren't special in any way. We just happen to have training and a particular set of tools. And just like a carpenter or a plumber 
it's really important not just to know and have those tools, but to know when and where to use them. Um, you can't, you, sh you know, if you have a hammer, you can't use just a hammer to fix every single problem. You have to find the right type of problem for that tool. And so a lot of what we do as lawyers who are trained in these particular tools uh, is to understand the tools, understand why they're useful, but also understand when they're useful and how to apply them and, and use that expertise. So I'm going to pass it along next to uh, my colleague, Andrew. The legal system that many of us think about when we talk about law uh, started far from here in the United Kingdom. Eugene's already referred to some of this. Um, Canada's parliament and provincial legislative assemblies, which make our laws, are modeled under the, off of the United Kingdom's parliament. Uh, England's queen continues to be our head of state, and our court system is modeled on the UK court system. Many, many of our institutions are based out of England. But in the 1700s and 1800s, when England first asserted its sovereignty over Canada, what's now Canada, um, that country was going through a lot of change, including changes that affected its legal system. The agricultural revolution and then the industrial revolution had forced farmers off of their lands that they, they, they and their families had farmed for generations and moved them into cities to become factory workers uh, or sent them overseas to help colonize Canada or other parts of the world. And the governments and courts of the day were modifying the law to better define who had the right to profit from land and water and who had the right to complain if land, water, and air were polluted. So by the time English law came to Canada, there were many key assumptions embedded in the core principles of English law uh, that became part of Canadian law. From the assumption that nature did not have value unless it was owned and used, to a very strong bias in favor of private property rights. One more, please. Um, when four provinces came together in 1867 and agreed to form a new country, it was the United Kingdom's Parliament that passed the British North America Act, and that became Canada's Constitution Act, 1867, defining the, the powers of both the pro provincial governments and the national government under this new legal system. The 1867 Constitution, as Eugene sort of alluded to, largely ignored the existing legal systems of Indigenous nations. In addition, because it was 1867, no one thought to say whether it was the federal government or the provincial governments who had responsibility for the environment. And since then, the courts have said that both levels of government, both those levels of government have a joint responsibility and joint powers over the environment. In 1982, at the request of the Canadian government, the UK Parliament passed a second Constitution Act, the Constitution Act 1982, which recognized the rights of First Nations and Indigenous peoples, uh, as well as recognizing rights, various rights that are, were guaranteed for all Canadians through the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. It's against this constitutional backdrop that environmental law has evolved in Canada. And I'll turn it over to Stephanie to talk a bit about one environmental law that we've been involved with. So one of the, the primary forms of law that you might think of as law in Canada is law that's written down. Um, we call that acts and statutes or regulations and a good example of that's the criminal code. And in environmental law we work with a lot of statutes. So a couple examples are the Impact Assessment Act, the Environmental Protection Act. I work in uh, marine protection law and ocean law so I work a lot with the Oceans Act and the Fisheries Act. Um, and what we do in law reform, that refers to the process of trying to change those laws. So I'd be interested if you could type a few uh, reasons in the chat about why you might think we'd want to change our environmental laws. Um, Andrew just touched on it. If you have any ideas, I'd love to see them. The questions, good question. Yeah, they might be extremely outdated. Um, or they're not doing enough to protect the environment. 
yet and we're learning more and the laws need to change. They might not be sustainable. Serving the rights of indigenous people, definitely. Those are all great reasons. Um, so in environmental law, we find, um, as Andrew mentioned, some of our laws um, are there to protect private property um, and economic growth and are less focused on environmental protection and sustainability, or we've just learned more about what we need um, to protect the planet that we maybe didn't know before. So how does the law get changed? Um, this is a picture of the House of Commons. Um, it's the place where federal laws are made in Ottawa. Um, and this is where your elected MPs will spend their time. Um, and it kind of looked like a, a very serious and almost sacred place. Um, but actually those MPs are facing a lot of pressure um, or influence from other forces, including you, the people who elected them, um, but also from corporate interests. Um, and so that plays a big role in how our laws are shaped. But one of the really interesting things in law reform is that elected MPs um, are really interested in hearing from their constituents, the people who elected them. Um, and they take it pretty seriously when uh, people want to call, write, or meet with them. And we've noticed that that's, that doesn't really matter your age, whether you're able to vote yet or not. And sometimes it's even more powerful when they hear from people who, younger people who can't vote but care enough to talk about the issues that concern them. So I want to tell you a story um, about, a law reform story about how this um, has played out. And it's a story um, that I was involved in. Um, as I mentioned, I work in ocean law. And a big part of that work focuses on marine protected areas. And a good way to think about those, it's kind of like a national park that's in the water. Um, and it's important we have those because there's a lot of activities going on in the ocean. Um, I'm sure you know about shipping, fishing, um, offshore oil and gas drilling. And we really need places where marine life is protected from all those impacts so that it can recover. Um, and thrive. And also because we don't really know what impacts we're going to have on the environment in the long term. So we kind of think of these as our insurance policy in the ocean. And I want to tell you about a particular marine protected area um, in Laurentian Channel. You can see it here on the map. It's um, off the coast. Um, it's off the in the Gulf of the St. Lawrence um, on the east coast. And it's this deep submarine valley that runs from the Gulf to the continental shelf. And because of the way water circulates in this area, um, it's quite warm on the sea floor. So it's a great place for marine life. It's very abundant. There's a lot of food. Um, and it's the home to some endangered animals like this um, uh, leatherback sea turtle that you see here. And it's also an important um, migration route for uh, over 20 species of dolphins and whales, including this North Atlantic right whale that you can see here. Um, so in 2017, uh, the federal government decided to create a marine protected area in Laurentian Channel. And you can kind of see the outline here where how it maps along that channel that we saw on the, the slide before. Um, but uh, at the same time, uh, the oil and gas industry had discovered that there was some pretty rich oil and gas deposits in the seafloor along this area. And so what ended up happening in the process of um, trying to designate this area was there was a lot of pressure from industry. Um, and in the end, the marine protected area, um, what you can see here was the light orange part. So it was 88% of the marine protected area was still open to oil and gas drilling. Only 12%, the dark orange, was actually fully protected. So I'm wondering um, if you could just vote here saying yes or no based kind of on your intuition, whether you think it makes sense to have oil and gas drilling within a marine protected area. <laughs> a lot of no's. Yeah, so um, if you said no, um, I'd agree with you and so would most Canadians. Uh, but interestingly, um, Laurentian Channel wasn't the first MPA to have oil and gas gas drilling in it, and it probably wouldn't have been the last one except for um, the action that was taken by environmental groups and by citizens in Canada. Um, so the reason why this could even happen at, at all is because of a weakness in the structure of the law. 
So this is um, an excerpt from the Oceans Act. These are, this is the act that allows marine protected areas to be created. And it's a little tiny there, but basically this provision allows um, the government to create a regulation designated a protected area um, and also create some prohibitions of activities that can happen within the area. Um, and then in this next slide, um, you see this is actually from the draft regulation for Laurentian Channel. Um, and so because of this structure, what ends up happening is there's a general prohibition on all activities that disturb, damage, or destroy uh, marine life within a protected area. And then there's a list of exceptions. And because nowhere in the Oceans Act or in the regulations under the Act does it say there are certain activities that just can't happen because they're too harmful, these exceptions can be pretty much anything. Um, and as you see here, I've highlighted some of the exceptions in the draft Laurentian Channel regulations, seismic surveying, which is really loud and damaging, um, oil and gas exploration, and oil and gas pipelines. Um, and this is common, this is a common structure throughout all MPA, Marine Protected Area regulations. Um, and so what we did at West Coast was um, we looked at the law and we decided um, to write a brief about how it could be different and how it could be stronger. And we called for what we call the floor of basic protections. So what I just talked about, protections that would ban those really harmful activities from being present in marine protected areas. So there wouldn't be this kind of wiggle room for negotiations with industry to roll back protection over time. Um, and in, I have to say like it's, it's a great solution. It's one thing to write a brief on the topic, but it's another thing to get a government to actually accept that and change the law. Um, and that's where Ranch and Channel comes back in. So we released this brief in May 2017, and in June of the same year, the government published their draft uh, protected area regulations that I just showed you that allowed oil and gas. And a number of uh, NGOs put on a letter writing campaign um, to protect Lawrence and Channel from oil and gas activity. And like you, people could see that there was just like, it was just totally incongruous to have these two together. And they were pretty outraged and the government received 70,000 letters on the topic, which is a huge number. It's almost unheard of. And because of this, because so many people cared, the government realized they had to do something. And those 70,000 letters were the first piece in the chain of events that cascaded. The government started a study. Scientists started speaking out. Politicians spoke about it in the House of Commons. Journalists started picking up the story and writing articles. And all of this created momentum. Um, which ended in uh, April of 2019, so a year ago, and two years after the regulations had started, um, with the government announcing it was going to redraft the regulations and, and publish them, and there would be no more oil and gas within the protected area. But not only um, did it say that about Laurentian Channel, but it also announced that there would be no oil and gas activity, no harmful bottom trawl fishing, mining, or dumping within any marine protected areas created in the future. So we, we got a commitment to that floor of basic protections that we were talking about. Um, and what this story, I think, demonstrates about law reform, it, it demonstrates a couple of things. Um, the first is that law reform is a bit of a slow process. This took two years to get to, um, but in the end, it creates lasting change. And it's one of the best ways we know to do that. Um, the other thing it demonstrates, I think, is that law reform allows us to, to pull back and see the bigger picture. So if we had just focused on Laurentian Channel, maybe we would have gotten the results there, but we wouldn't have gotten this commitment that looked at all MPAs everywhere. So law reform allows us to, to see the bigger picture and the structure and to make those changes that need to be done. Um, and the last thing I think is that the legal solution is a part of the puzzle. It's a really important part. As um, Eugene mentioned though, we're just tradespeople and a big part of what actually creates change is engagement from citizens and concerned scientists, politicians over time to create um, a new vision for how we're gonna, um, I guess, our relationship with the natural world. So with that, I'll pass on to Andrew. Um, he's gonna talk about another way to change the law through the courts.
Thanks, Stephanie. Um, some of you have probably seen Hollywood legal dramas about a large polluting corporation that gets sued by a plucky lawyer or law firm. Um, if you have a favorite legal drama about the environment, please um, type it into the chat because I, I know we all, many of us have a lot of extra time to catch up on our viewing these days. And some of those shows are, are just great in terms of getting us thinking about environmental law. Uh, the reality is that there are certain features of the Canadian legal system that make that type of lawsuit against big companies for pollution less common in Canada than they are in the United States. Um, but clearly going to court, known as litigation, is uh, one of the tools in the environmental lawyer's toolbox. Many of the cases brought in Canada and the US focus on trying to force governments to properly apply environmental laws. Good laws won't work if the government is always interpreting them in ways that favor powerful uh, and rich companies. This is Josette Weir in her garden in Smithers in Northern British Columbia. She was trained in France as a pediatrician, a, a children's doctor, and for many years has been concerned with the impacts of pesticides, chemicals that kill weeds, bugs, and other pest species on the health of children. In 2008, she approached West Coast Environmental Law because she had found out about scientific studies that showed that the commonly used pesticide glyphosate is unsafe, <clears throat> both to humans and to frogs and, uh, frogs and other amphibians. Glyphosate is best known as the main ingredient in the pesticide Roundup, which is used in backyards and around our neighborhoods sometimes, uh, but it's also sprayed from plains in huge quantities across species forests to kill alder and other tree species that logging companies don't want. Under Canadian law, a government agency known as the Pest Management Regulatory Agency, or PMRA for short, is supposed to approve pesticides for use in Canada only if they will not cause a significant health or environmental impact. The law also says that members of the public, like Josette, can request a special review if there's new scientific information about the safety of a pesticide. So Josette, with help from our legal aid program, requested a special review. She pointed out th that a, an official with the government of BC had prepared a, a, a volume of re um, reporting on different studies that showed that frogs and other amphibians were at risk from glyphosate. And she also pointed to several studies linking the pesticide to a rare cancer. The agency refused to even really look at her evidence uh, or to do a special review, saying that they would consider it the next time they did a general review of the pesticide, some years away in the future. The agency has had a history of pushing off concerns raised by environmentalists. So Josette and her lawyer went to court, arguing that the law required a special review right away. Josette's lawyer, made a strategic choice to focus on how glyphosate hurts amphibians because the science in that area was particularly strong. Environmental lawyers and all lawyers sometimes have to choose to focus on the arguments most likely to win over a judge. They won their court case in November 2011. The judge said that Josette was entitled to a special review of the impacts of glyphosate on frogs and amphibians. This was a real win because going forward, the agency is going to have to evaluate pesticide safety when new evidence is brought to their attention. Other environmentalists and health advocates have already used this decision to get special reviews of other products. But when after the case was over, the agency reviewed Josette's evidence, it decided that the risk to the environment was acceptable and allowed glyphosate to continue being used in Canada despite real risks to frogs and, and increasing evidence about the risk to humans. The court's order only required the agency to follow the proper process to consider the science, but the courts usually won't second guess the actual final government decision, especially when it's done by an expert body like the PMRA. So while challenging government decisions in court can be a powerful tool, tool too often laws are written in ways that even when we win, the government can go back and do what it was going to do anyhow. Activists using court challenges of this type need to have a broader strategy in mind to figure out what they're gonna do 
if the government makes the decision, same decision again, or how to convince the government not to make the same decision over again. Changing the law to better protect the environment and public health, in the way that Stephanie was talking about, may be part of the, that strategy. One exciting area of environmental litigation are the climate lawsuits that are being brought by youth and others under Canada's constitution, the fundamental law of Canada that Eugene referred to. In section seven of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, the government promises to not to harm your right to life, liberty, and security of the person. And climate change does that. Because this is a constitutional right, the hope is that the courts may be willing, more willing to look at whether the government is doing enough to fight climate change and the, whether the actual impact of laws is enough to protect uh, climate change. Cases of this type include a class action lawsuit filed by Environment Jeunesse, a Quebec environmental group against the federal government, uh, an unfortunately unsuccessful legal challenge to the Trans Mountain, Mountain Pipeline expansion, which we supported, brought by You Stop TMX for climate strikers. Um, La Rose versus Canada, brought against the Canadian government by 15 youth from across the country with support from the Pacific Center for Environmental Law and Litigation and the David Suzuki Foundation and Mather versus Ontario, brought by seven youth against the Ontario government with help from EcoJustice, as well as uh, a recent legal challenge brought against Canada by two Wet'suwet'en uh, hereditary chiefs, raising these same issues. We've also supported the organization Generation Squeeze to take part in court hearings about Canada's carbon tax to highlight the impacts of climate change on the rights of youth. Similar arguments are being raised in courts around the world, and in some cases, youth and other environmentalists are winning. We've also spent some time encouraging lawsuits, not against governments, but against global companies for the climate impacts of their, their products. We've called for a lawsuit on, a class action lawsuit on behalf of all of British Columbia's local governments against Chevron, Shell, and other fossil fuel companies. So far, we haven't convinced the BC or Canadian local government to file that lawsuit, but Victoria, the city of Victoria is having a law, legal opinion done, and both Toronto and Vancouver are actively looking at legal options to recover climate costs from fossil fuel companies. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Eugene to comment about other ways that litigation is being used. Thanks, Andrew. So this uh, is a picture of one of the best moments of my professional life. Uh, this is moments after we got the decision from the Federal Court of Appeal on August 30th, 2018, uh, on a case now known as Slaywitooth versus Canada, which as many of you will probably remember was a case that quashed or canceled the original approvals of the Trans Mountain Pipeline. I think uh, the body language of everyone in the room kind of speaks for itself in terms of how excited we were. Uh, and I wanted to share this for a couple of reasons. One is, you know, this obviously there are these rare moments of, of victory and success uh, through litigation in this case uh, to get to achieve what we want. But also to just point out that, you know, the environmental issues are not only governed by what, we're, what we would maybe think about as environmental laws. You've heard a little bit about the Oceans Act and the Fisheries Act. Um, you know, you might think about the Species at Risk Act as environmental laws. But just like the environment is not a standalone issue that's separate from, for example, the economy or health, in, uh, environmental legal issues are not just focused on environmental legislation. In this case, um, the one of the main winning arguments was not actually grounded in an environmental statute or uh, an environmental, specifically environmental part of the Constitution. It was actually grounded in Section 35 of the Constitution, which is the section that recognizes, affirms, and upholds uh, Aboriginal rights. And it was on a lot based on those a lot of those arguments and primarily you'll, you may be familiar with this idea of the failure of the duty to consult first nations on decisions that impact their rights that this case was successful and so i want to point that out because um, 
we don't want to just think about environmental law as specifically environmental statutes. A lot of what I do might be considered corporate law because it's often corporations who are trying to push forward these projects. And so understanding their structures uh, is an important part of, 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 of responding to, to their decision making, not just in court, but at shareholder meetings and other places like that. Other areas include, you know, municipal planning laws have huge impacts on, on environmental issues, public health, and so on. And so I think really the big takeaway here is that environmental issues are not just about environmental law. There are because environment touches on so many parts of our lives. And in fact, the reality is that an oil spill or a salmon or uh, air pollution or climate change don't recognize jurisdictions. They don't recognize these kind of artificial legal lines that, um, that, that, that legal systems put in place in order to try and kind of comp compartmentalize specific issues. And so just like the air is all around and it's moving freely, um, you know, th these issues um, need a, a multitude of tools um, that we talked about. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to talk next about uh, Indigenous law, which, we which I touched on at the top. Now, Indigenous law, to be clear, uh, is a different thing from Aboriginal law. Aboriginal law is the interaction of, is the Canadian law and, and the way that it interacts with Indigenous or Aboriginal peoples. Uh, it's, it's the basis of the, of the last photo that you saw around the duty to consult um, and, and, and deals with rights in that manner. Indigenous law, by contrast, is the law of Indigenous peoples themselves. Remember at the start we talked about how when the first settlers arrived there were existing uh, complex societal structures and decision-making processes and law. And, and remember, law is not just what's written down or the rules that people agree on, but also the process of getting to those rules. So if we think back to, for example, the Indian Act in Canadian law and the ban on the potlatch uh, in Indigenous communities that lasted until 1951, that was actually a ban on legal procedure. It would kind of be like saying that you can't have um, debates on, on passing legislation. In, in, in kind of Canadian context. So Indigenous law is the law of the, the Indigenous peoples themselves. And it's something that um, Canadian courts have recognized that it continues to exist in Canada, that it was never extinguished or terminated by Canadian law. But of course, as we know, multiple um, acts of colonization have made some of those uh, laws more challenging to kind of express in a contemporary way. You know, the, the potlatch ban is a really obvious example. And as we see the resurgence of those practices and cultures, we're seeing a resurgence of Indigenous laws themselves. And what you see in the photo is uh, an excerpt from the tsleil assessment of the Trans Mountain Pipeline. I have a, my, my home copy here. Not working great with the green screen, but um, you can download this online. And really what's really interesting about this in my view is that it applied to Tsleil-Waututh and Coast Salish legal traditions and legal standards to contemporary and cutting edge scientific studies. So there were studies around oil spill likelihood and oil spill probability and oil spill cleanup and impacts. And, it, and, it, and apply the lens, an indigenous law lens, uh, to that. And, and, and why that's important is that um, it's really that lens that makes a difference. You've got the data, you've got these decisions, but as we've heard earlier, sometimes you can have very convincing evidence that a particular product is, um, is very damaging uh, to, for example, amphibians in the case of Roundup. Um, but even though you have that very strong evidence, it's also about the lens of like, of saying, well, is this justified? Is there a balancing that happens here? And I think it's how we the, how we look at that balance that ultimately has an impact on the on the on the decision. And so, uh, in this Slaywood assessment, and and it was specifically not called an environmental assessment because it looked at cultural impacts, economic impacts, 
a number, a, a much more holistic approach, um, the, the conclusion was that oil spills are inevitable, they cannot be effectively cleaned up, and uh, would have cast catastrophic impacts on, on Tsleil-Waututh homelands. And for that reason, Tsleil-Waututh said, this is not a good use of our lands and territories, and we are rejecting it under our own law. And, and if you think about this in kind of international terms, it's this idea of free, prior, and informed consent. It's hard to imagine a more informed approach than doing your own assessment, grounded in your own laws, in order to withdraw or, or, or in order to not grant consent for this project. Now, of course, as many of you know, uh, the project uh, was sent back uh, for reevaluation and, and another approval. And we are back in court uh, uh, again, challenging this, again, primarily grounded in this case in Aboriginal law, the Canadian law, in part because that's um, seen as, a, as, a, as an important strategic tool. Uh, but, the, but of course, it's not the only tool. And the last thing I want to say about Indigenous laws is that there, there's so, I mean, it's, there's a many, many of them and they're, and they're emerging and, and, and being applied all the time here and not just on project specific things, but on higher, you know, on like marine planning or land use planning, uh, huge, huge um, breadth of, of, of areas that it's applied to. And it's something that we're really lucky to get to work on through our RELAW project at West Coast Environmental Law, where we work directly with, uh, with Indigenous nations to apply their own laws to, to decision making. And it's increasingly starting to work its way into Canadian law. And on a high level, again, without getting too specific, I think the part of the solution to getting towards a, a safer, a healthier, and more sustainable world is to have those Indigenous laws and worldviews Im embedded in part of Canadian decision making. Because when we make better decisions that don't necessarily just look at the next quarter or the next electoral cycle, but in, but in fact, multiple generations into the future, we're going to make different decisions. And so um, I'm excited to be part of this work. Uh, I've learned uh, so much from uh, Indigenous legal experts who are not tr Canadian trained lawyers by any means, but who've, who have the expertise in their own Indigenous laws to help to inform not only, an ide not only identifying threats, but also identifying solutions so that we can all move forward together. Uh, and I'll pass it next to uh, Alexis, I believe. All right. Uh, well, thank you so much uh, for uh, giving us that great introduction to environmental law, Eugene, Andrew, and Stephanie. Um, now, I just want to talk a little bit about how you can start getting involved in legal initiatives for the environment. Um, so there are a few things we can suggest off the top. One of them is if you have questions about how the law might be able to help you uh, solve an environmental problem in your community, uh, give us a call or send us an email. Uh, we have a legal advice helpline that you can call or email uh, to speak to a lawyer and get some free advice, or we can help connect you to a private lawyer in your region. We also sometimes provide funding support for our individuals or groups uh, who want to take action, legal action for the environment. Um, so, you know, for example, if you're worried about industrial logging that's impacting your local watershed and you want to take legal action to do something about it, uh, you can give us a call or any email and uh, we'll talk about your legal options. Um, I'll post a link in the chat after this uh, so you can find some more information about our legal aid programs. Uh, another way you can get involved is just by staying up to date on these legal issues. And we talk about this stuff all the time at West Coast, so I would recommend subscribing to our newsletter. We have a monthly email newsletter. Uh, we also have uh, multiple social media channels where you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And we just try to do our best to keep you in the loop about uh, opportunities to take action, about those key moments where we need people like you to stand up for strong environmental laws and uh, kind of help with some of those law reform initiatives that Stephanie was talking about. 
Um, there are other opportunities, you know, like signing petitions, contacting decision makers, um, or attending events and webinars like this one. So if you go to our website and click on the subscribe button, um, then you can sign up for regular updates about all this kind of stuff. Um, and another way, if you want to take action right now, uh, we can suggest one way that you can stand up for strong environmental laws today. Um, there was a leaked memo recently that uh, that revealed that the uh, oil and gas industry in Canada has been asking the federal government to weaken environmental laws um, in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic and also to delay uh, regulations or policies that would uphold Indigenous rights. So we think that this is not a good idea right now. <laughs> um, environmental organizations like West Coast have been speaking up about this and urging the federal government not to roll back environmental laws. We think this is really not the time to be uh, weakening the rules that protect our uh, health and safety and the environment. Um, so if you want to help, one way you can do that is by contacting your own member of parliament and just telling them why you think that they should stand strong and resist the pressure to weaken our environmental laws. Um, we'll post a link in the chat as well for a website where you can look up your MP and the contact information for your MP. And we just encourage you to try writing a letter to them, sending them a personal message, um, or contacting them in some way to explain how you feel and why you think it's important for us to maintain strong environmental laws right now and in the future. So, uh, now I've got a bit of we've got a bit of time left to respond to your questions. Um, I just want to note that we are getting a little bit close to our uh, the end of our hour together, but uh, our panelists have agreed to stay on for a little bit after um, after the hour to try to squeeze in a few more questions. So if you have time and you'd like to stick around uh, for a few minutes and uh, get in a couple more questions and answers, uh, we'll be happy to stick around for a little bit too. Okay, so uh, we've had some questions. I saw some questions in the chat. Um, I think one question that was in here that was a good one um, was about what the difference is between laws, regulations, policies, uh, and all these different kind of buzzwords that you might hear. <laughs> yeah, I can. I'll, I can take a stab at it. So um, they're all different. Um, what we include in the category of law is statute or regulation. Um, a policy is usually a government uh, intention or a document, but it's not legally binding, but it might be an intention to act a certain way. Um, we have laws um, are passed by parliament or provincial legislature. So if they go through the parliamentary process, and then a law will enable a regulation to be passed by the government while it's in power. Um, so usually by what we call the executive or cabinet. So it, it goes through less of a process when it becomes a regulation. Um, do you have any additions to that, Eugene? And a policy would be the next step below, which is um, you know, in, in, in many ways how a law and a regulation is interpreted and applied on, on, on the ground. And if you think about it, you know, there's that kind of level of formality and process has advantages and disadvantages. It takes a lot more time and process to change a law than a regulation and a, and, and a policy, which doesn't actually have any um, kind of uh, public discussion element to it. Um, and so if we think about how we might respond to particular issues or how we might try to Try to address particular issues. Um, there, it, there are there are pros and cons of having certain things in in each in each level, and I think one of the things that we often pay attention to is, you know, what the regulations say because you know you know that saying the devil is in the details. Um, really, often it's it, that is where a lot of the uh, kind of minutia or where the kind of deep you know how how exactly a law is going to play out on the land. Uh, is going to look and similarly with policies and the way that the laws are interpreted and applied by various um, bodies. Great. Thanks, Eugene. Um, I have a question now from uh, that came in during registration. Um, 
Are there any laws that all of us should familiarize ourselves with regarding protecting and advocating? There are the, the protecting and advocating that we do. That one. Um, I think in terms of, of like environmental law, there probably isn't one statute. There's certainly statutes that come up a lot if you're interested in environmental law. The, the what's now the Impact Assessment Act, the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. Um, uh, but really, if you're working on a particular issue, the statutes may be quite different, uh, depending on what those issues are. Um, the, there are certain statutes that are less focused on specific issues, but maybe more on creating tools um, for people to engage in, in the democracy. So uh, the Freedom of Information and Privacy Act, um, uh, the, the um, Protection of Public Participation Act that protects you if you're you're sued for speaking out. Um, those types of pieces of legislation are well worth being aware of generally as well. And then there'll be a lot of variation uh, from province to province. If there are people working outside of British Columbia, the legal frameworks related to the environment may be quite different in Ontario. Um, so I think it's difficult to give it a one size fits all answer, but but there are certain pieces that that it's well worth um, being aware of. I also will say that sometimes activists become very familiar with the legal structures that are in place for their particular issue to the point that they're potentially more knowledgeable than a lot of lawyers about those issues. And I've seen cases where people will come to us with going, well, what about this as a legal option? And we'll point to some obscure piece of legislation that probably I would never have found. Um, so I, I think it's less, you know, are there general pieces that you should be aware of and more if you're working in a specific area, make sure you do understand what statutes uh, are applicable to, to your situation and, and drill deep. I'll add, to, I'll add one really brief thing to that, um, because I, and I agree with Andrew, but one other piece, uh, we talked a little bit about the Constitution, we talked a little bit about jurisdiction and, and what that means is the area where where that body's law applies and there's a lot of discussion around uh the jurisdiction of the federal government versus the provincial governments for those of you following trans mountain you'll know that 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 was part of uh the discussion uh in particular in the bc reference case which was about the regulation of, of diluted bitumen and as andrew mentioned uh, if you looked at those two sections in the Constitution, section 91 and 92, they set out all these different areas that are the responsibilities of, of, of each of those, the provinces or the federal government. And the environment is not in there. And part of the reason is because when the Constitution was drafted, environment wasn't an issue that we really thought about in that way. But as I mentioned, so many of those uh, areas uh, that, are with, that are within there actually are, do impact the environment, whether it's commerce or health, uh, or inter or trade, all of those things have environmental elements. And, and as Andrew mentioned, the courts have acknowledged that the environment is an example of a shared jurisdiction between those. But sometimes you'll have it, an issue that is uh, very clearly in one jurisdiction or another, and that's uh, often helpful in, in deciding where to bring that type of case. And of course, I'll just reiterate the point I made earlier that these jurisdictions are what we would say uh, in, 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 as large as legal fictions. They are creations of the Constitution. And of course, um, uh, an oil spill or um, air pollution is not going to, to be floating along and then say, oh, now I'm in federal jurisdiction, I'm going to stop polluting. The reality of our physical world is that we're interconnected. And so sometimes that can be a real challenge in order to figure out the best area or the best court or forum to bring it towards, especially because uh, the natural world doesn't doesn't ever respect those not those jurisdictional boundaries, but it's it's often a very useful part of of those discussions as well. Thanks, Eugene. Um, so another question we had from registration was, what options are available to people when the Enviro law enforcers aren't enforcing? All right, I'll, I'll take that one. I think. Um, so that's a great question, um, and, and it, it can be really frustrating where you see, you know, the law is clear, someone's in viola violation of it, and the government just won't enforce the law. Um, there, unfortunately, a lot of that's political. There, there is something called a private prosecution, where an individual goes and lays charges that should be laid maybe by government, 
um, but they, they act as the prosecutor. They lay the charges, they go before a judge, and the judge says, they, they, they ask the judge to say that there is a, an arguable case against the, the offender, um, the accused, and uh, they, that that person should come to court and answer it. The difficulty here is that under Canadian law, um, the discretion about whether the, 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 the government, the government retains a, a discretion to step in and take over those cases and then to stop them or, or continue them as they see fit. Uh, and so certainly in British Columbia, the usual practice uh, of the provincial government has been to stay those prosecutions. Uh, they will say that it's because they generally aren't uh, done at the level, you know, they aren't, they aren't well enough done, but the, the perception of environment, the environmental law bar, I think, a community is that, is that the province just generally wants to have control over prosecutions and will not generally receive them. Now, there's a difference with the federal government. The federal government actually is much more open to taking over a private prosecution and continuing with it. Um, and there have been a number of cases in BC and elsewhere where charges have been private prosecutions have been laid for violations of federal statutes, the Fisheries Act, um, the uh, Migratory Birds Convention Act, and the federal government has taken over those, pro the, the cases, the judges have allowed the case to go ahead and the, the federal government has taken over those cases and uh, pursued them, uh, in some cases getting a conviction. Um, we were very involved in, in a case recently where um, uh, a, a tanker was um, driven off a road and, and uh, tanker truck rather was driven off a road and punctured causing jet fuel to spill into Lemon Creek in the Kootenays. Uh, and uh, there was a private prosecution launch there. Um, and uh, the, the government, you know, the, the, the government took that over, stayed it, but relaunched the, the, uh, the charges and there were just recently conviction, the convictions were just confirmed recently by the Court of Appeal. Uh, so, um, you know, they can work, that we've also been involved, we, we spent a lot of time and energy trying to get a private prosecution against um, the Mount Pauly Corporation for the Mount Pauly breach, um, and uh, that was stayed by the province who never did lay charges. So um, one of the tools, there's also situations where the government itself is the one who's not really uh, enforcing the rule, and then that type of legal challenge I spoke about earlier uh, where you're challenging them either for making a wrong decision or for not doing something that they're required to do under the statute and you're suing the government, that's, uh, um, you know, that's another way to proceed. It's, it's different than the sort of uh, more criminal, quasi-criminal charges that we're talking about. Uh, I just got a note saying I didn't say what stayed meant. In this case, stayed would have meant that the, the, the charge would be withdrawn essentially. Um, so th there was no um, consequence for the offender. Okay, so I just want to flag that it's uh, 1259 here. So if anyone has to drop off, uh, thank you so much for joining us, but we will stay on for another few questions uh, if folks are interested. Um, we've got a question here uh, about rights of nature. Uh, and there were a couple different questions about this actually. So do you see a place for making legal cases on behalf of the rights of natural systems like rivers or forests in Canada? And another related question was, what rights do animals have? Yeah, this is a really exciting um, area of law that's been developing quite a bit recently. You've probably heard about rivers um, getting rights, um, areas of land getting rights. Um, we just heard that um, a suburb in Costa Rica granted citizenship to bees, um, bats, and butterflies, and other pollinators. Um, so it's definitely an area that's developing. Um, in Canada and around the world, Indigenous people have been, their legal traditions, um, we might say they recognize the rights of nature or they recognize obligations of humans towards the natural world more than we typically do in the Western colonial legal systems. Um, so this idea has been around in a certain form for a very long time. Um, in Canada, in Canadian law, we don't have any developments right now, um, but there's a lot of people working on it. And I think it's the area of law that's gonna develop, um, you know, you know, like not too long ago, women didn't have right to vote. Um, before that, there was like slavery. Um, Non-white people in North America didn't have any rights. So um, 
it's just a process of change. And I think this is one of the areas that could really change the way our environmental laws work and reshape them. Um, so yeah, the, I guess the answer is it's developing and it's pretty exciting and it's definitely an area to watch. I think it, um, one other thing is I think it really reflects a change in, in how we perceive our relationships with the environment. And that's really what law does is, is a way of reflecting those relationships. And I think rights of nature is starting to make more and more sense to more people. So I see a lot of hope there. I can just follow on, on that. I think that it's important to, there are cases where courts have just declared that nature or animal, individual animals have, have rights. Um, in many other cases, uh, there's been legislation uh, passed by governments that, that, that recognizes new rights. Uh, most notable examples being in New Zealand where, where due to agreements between the Maori people there and the New Zealand government, they enacted laws recognizing it, the, the personhood of a river and of a mountain. Um, I think that that's one of the more likely scenarios in Canada. I think the more the more people talk about this and ask for that to be something that the legislatures uh, do, there's more potential that, that our governments will follow the, the lead of the people there and start uh, enacting legislation that recognizes some of that. I, I think there are paths through which it could be argued and more through just uh, asking the judges to make law, but I think that that's probably less likely in Canada. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so we have a, another good question here in the chat. Um, how did you know that you wanted to be an environmental lawyer and that it was the right career path for you? I can take a, I'll start uh, with this. So, you know, to be honest, I uh, don't really consider myself an environmentalist in the uh in in many senses i came to this work through uh primarily working on human rights and anti-poverty work and 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 you know some of the things that i said earlier about how environmental issues actually address or touch on so many other issues is part of that and so uh for me I, it wasn't uh necessarily a, a goal uh, that I was working towards initially. I was certainly interested uh, in, uh, in, in particular, international uh, responses to climate change. When I was in uh, undergrad, this might date me a bit, but uh, it was right after the Kyoto Protocol was first signed and there was all kinds of hope about this kind of international cooperation. And as we're seeing right now in response to COVID-19, you know, the international community can work together to address large existential threats. Uh, unfortunately, that hasn't happened uh, with near the, uh, the same urgency or uh, efficiency or efficacy as we've seen uh, with uh, the pandemic, but, but it's very clear that it can happen. And so my path to this came initially through doing um, anti-poverty work in the downtown east side and human rights work more broadly. Um, but, but, but also seeing how, um, in particular, energy projects and climate impacts uh, have a huge and disproportionate impact on the most marginalized uh, uh, folks most often. Uh, and that happens for other environmental uh, uh, impacts as well. And so my path was kind of through that. Um, obviously, I care very deeply about the environment, about the environment but, but primarily I came to this through uh, human rights work. On that or? Um, I was I was an environmental activist uh, before going to law school. Um, I started to become involved in high school and in early university. And um, uh, in fact, I had a few uh, sort of opportunities to to work with a, a woman who, um, uh, Joan Rousseau. Um, who uh, had some legal training, but wasn't actually a lawyer. She, she had the first year of law school and she, she and I would go, she would drag, when I had a, a question about why, what are these injunctions that keep being given by judges against protesters and how do those work? She would go, let's go find out and drag me off to the law library. Um, and so that was a great opportunity to realize that I had some interest in that type of research. Um, even before, before going anywhere through, um, anywhere close to law school. 
Uh, but actually, I, I made the final decision to apply to law school um, when I was waiting for my trial after being arrested in Clackwatt Sound. Um, and I was having a lot of interactions with the, the legal system that were not entirely positive and where I felt my views were being misunderstood uh, by the courts. And um, so I had stood on the road along with 800 other people plus uh, um, and been arrested for stopping logging. Um, and uh, I think to a certain degree, it was, there were good reasons that that experience pushed me in that direction. To a certain degree, I was probably just saying, look, you know, um, we were accused of, of criminal contempt, which meant that we disrespected the courts. And I think to a certain degree, I was just saying, I don't disrespect the courts. Look, I'll prove it, I'll become a lawyer, which is a really lousy reason, I think, to go into law. Uh, my general advice in terms of whether someone wants to go into law or not is, is don't go in just because you think it's a way to save the world. Um, go into it if you think you will actually genuinely enjoy it. There's ways to save, you know, to work to improve the world in all kinds of fields. Um, but uh, but there has there's sometimes been a tendency, an assumption that if you if you want to make a difference, you need to be in law, and I, I don't think that that's necessarily true. Yeah, I don't have much to add. I think um, I agree with Andrew to go into law if you think it will be interesting, um, and uh, if you like reading things <laughs> and writing. I I think for me, I, I was just it felt like uh, right before I started law school, I heard about um, an internship uh, working um, in Alaska on a watershed protection and indigenous sovereignty, and. I was just like very excited about it and um, that took me down the path. So it kind of also depends where life takes you sometimes. Great, I think we have time for like two more questions. Um, one of them, a good one that just came in on the chat was, what gives you hope in this line of work, especially since law reform can feel really bureaucratic and can also feel like a really slow process, especially when it feels like we don't have much time left? Yeah, that's a great question, thanks. And um, you're right, uh, sometimes it can feel like uh, swimming upstream um, in, in a flood. And, uh, but at the end of the day, I think um, for me, what gives me hope is uh, A, um, doing the work that, I, I, that I, I believe is in the right direction and, um, and, and when we have those rare moments of victory, like what you saw, uh, really celebrating those. Um, and I think, you know, for, again, for me, a lot of this is, is the community and the movement that has grown, that I've seen grown uh, hugely over the last number of years, um, where um, in particular, folks like you, youth, are now starting to lead and you're starting to do so with, um, a, a, a big picture lens with an intersectional analysis that understands power um, and, and colonization that just didn't exist when, for example, when I was in high school. And so uh, a big piece of that is for me is that I'm inspired by and, and that gives me hope is, uh, is youth and youth activism. And I had the great fortune and pleasure to spend uh, some time uh, with Greta, uh, that's not working very well. There it is. Uh, when she was here in Vancouver, uh, it was so uh, it was so nice to get to chat with her a little bit and 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 see that she's you know leading uh, part of a really leading voice and speaking with such clarity. And so that gives me a lot of hope uh, moving forward. Thanks, Greta. Um, All right. Oh, did Andrew have something to say to add to that? <laughs> I, I mean, I think everyone get, gets hope in their own ways. I, I would much, I feel much more empowered and hopeful working on these issues than I think I, I would if I was just ignoring them and, or, or trying to ignore them. I also think, I mean, that's going to be a personal answer for everyone and, and for myself. I mean, I, I, I have a, a personal faith tradition that I draw on and, and I think others will have different answers about how they, they keep hopeful. So um, 
Okay, so just for one last question that kind of uh, came in in a few different forms uh, during registration um, from people about, you know, what's the best way for youth uh, with no background in politics to influence environmental decision making? Um, and are there internships or programs available for students with West Coast environmental law? Um, there's a, a few questions around that. So I can just speak to a couple things. Um, one, if you're interested in getting involved with us directly and working with us. Um, we do have uh, internships uh, for law students who are in law school. Uh, so if you're in high school, you might have to wait a little bit for that. But we do also invite high school students to be part of our uh, volunteer team. So we have a volunteer team called the Street Legal Team. Um, a lot of times that's involving community outreach at different events, public events in the city, uh, in Vancouver mostly. Um, of course, this year there probably aren't going to be many public events, so we'll uh, we'll be working on some volunteer opportunities that are more digital and online. So, if you are interested in joining our volunteer team, um, I would invite you to send us an email. There should be an email address uh, in your webinar registration emails, um, and feel free to just email us, and uh, we can send you some information about volunteering. And if you are in law school, or if you're a university student who's uh, gearing towards law school, uh, stay tuned. We usually post uh, applications in and around just November, December for the following summer placements for intern for law student interns. And we also at the same time have one internship, sometimes <laughs> most years uh, in the summer for someone to work uh, in the communications department with me doing some more community outreach uh, coordination. So uh, if you're interested in that, check our website soon. <laughs> Um, so I, I don't know, maybe I'll pass that on to others to answer if there are any other ways for youth to get involved other than the ones we've already mentioned. I mean, obviously, there are a lot of groups out there, a lot of movements out there that um, are working on environmental issues and, and find one that, that, that works for you and, and work passionately with them and just keep legal options as a question mark in the back of your your head, uh, you know, so as I said before, sometimes we have people come to us looking for legal help who really already know what the law says and what, and what the answers are. We're available particularly for groups in BC to answer questions about uh, legal options and, and uh, you know, one way to get involved in environmental law is to use it. Great. Um, well, unless our panelists had anything else to add, I think we've got to wrap it up now. Um, but thank you so much to everybody for participating, for submitting your questions, for being part of the chat. Um, if you want to learn more, check out our website, wcel.org. And like I said, uh, subscribe to our newsletter so you can stay tuned for more opportunities to get involved. And uh, yeah, thanks again for joining us today. We'll follow up with a recording uh, probably next week. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. everyone.